everyone. Welcome to our Leaders in Housing Counseling webinar. Today is Thursday, December 8th, 2022. And uh, we hope you sit back and enjoy this webinar today. Uh, a few things I want to go over before we get started today. The first is to please put in the chat box where you are watching from. Please put your city and state and the organization that you are affiliated with. We'd love to see who's watching our webinars. This webinar is being recorded. If there's anything that you miss, if you have to leave early, you can always visit our website at www hsgcenter.org and there you will find the complete list of all of our leaders in housing counseling webinars. A copy of the PowerPoint presentation will be added to the chat box throughout this presentation. Uh, so if you wanna follow along with us or with our PowerPoint presentation, you can do so by clicking the link. Closed captioning has been enabled for this webinar. If you need to use this feature, just toggle your mouse down at the bottom of your screen and click the CC button and the closed captioning will uh, show up at the bottom of your screen. There will be a portion uh, for questions and answers at the end of this presentation. But if you have any questions for any of our presenters or staff, you can do so please put your questions in the Q&A box and not the chat box. Our chat box constantly scrolls and we don't wanna miss any of your questions. So please remember to put your questions in the Q&A box. We do invite you to follow us on all of our social media channels, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, and our YouTube channel where you can also find all of our leaders in housing counseling webinars. And you can also go to our website. We invite you also to join us, join NHRC. If your organization has not taken the opportunity to become an NHRC member, please do so. We invite you to join us. We do have uh, a few discounts that you guys can utilize for your organization um, if you join NHRC. Bruce will go over those uh, benefits later on throughout this, uh, within this presentation. So with that, I am going to uh, turn this portion over to uh, Bruce and he will take it from there. Have a great one, y'all. <laughs> Welcome everybody and uh, oops. thank you, uh, Ebony. And I love that new uh, join us um, uh, uh, slide that's in there. Um, membership is a critical piece to our work. It's what pays for the stuff that nobody else wants to pay for, which would be lobbying. So please, you know, you want us to be out there doing our um, our good work, and um, uh, that's our um, that's our bread and butter here. So please um, uh, uh, join if you haven't, and renew. Um, and we have a end of the year push to try to get as many renewals in as we can. So thanks for that. Um, more about that later. So um, we're going to do a quick set of NHRC updates, um, and then uh, legislative updates from Christy. Um, and outreach updates. Uh, so um, we'll touch on all those. Um, really, the, um, the bulk of this call will be around building a housing counseling career path. And really what this is, is um, there's a very exciting opportunity that uh, Housing Action Illinois is doing. It's an opportunity with AmeriCorps that they're doing the program nationally. It's really aimed at housing counseling agencies. So very valuable. And um, we really appreciate their good work and, and making the announcement here. So there'll be plenty of time for questions if you have them. Remember, put them in the Q&A and um, we'll do a quick plug on join NHRC at the end of the call. So with that note, let me um, just start things off quickly. The, um, uh, we had credit reporting. Um, uh, I put credit reporting on the list. Last week, we talked about this and did a little bit of a survey. And um, I think a lot of agencies are seeing a doubling in the cost of their credit reports. And, um, and there's some talk about it being FICO. I'm not sure what that's about. FICO is a small part, not, not, certainly not enough to double the pricing, but whatever it is, it's really kind of rolled through our industry in a lot of ways. And so we'll, and we'll continue with the NHRC credit report discount. Um, but I'm assuming that it will also roll through our um, um, pricing as well, because um, a lot of these are pass-through costs. But um, 
one of the thoughts that I had, um, and we had, we did a tiny poll on last week, was whether we really need to pull um, three credit reports, whether we need three bureaus, and whether it's nationalized enough now that there's no gaps if you just pull two or maybe just one. And you know, again, these will just drop the price by a third each time you reduce the number of, of um, uh, bureaus you're pulling. Um, so. Um, we're, we're trying to get our arms around that. And since last time we talked, there are, um, we're hoping that there will be a little bit more um, research being done by some of the agencies. Um, and so maybe you all are, can look at this as well if you've got some ability to take a look at which credit, if, if you are able to pull out just one credit report for a client and then three, um, get us a sense of where things are at. We need us US is gonna look at this with some of their credit reports and Balance had an, uh, had an opportunity where they had um, um, pulled um, uh, one versus three, um, and, and hopefully they, they can make some distinction on, on what the difference looks like. And um, so, but let's, um, uh, let, let's keep looking at this. And if anybody has more information about this, um, please uh, put it in the chat or email me about it. Um, we, we really want to understand this better and, and be more effective on it. We think this is a, a way to manage the costs, but we have obviously completely understand that we want to be very careful about not missing anything in somebody's credit profile. And so make sure that um, we're doing the best by our clients. So from that, we'll, there'll be more to come and we'll do a deep dive in um, some of the more um, uh, sophisticated credit innovative programs that are out there, um, then that we'll have them um, on in, in January. So uh, a second thing um, on private equity purchasing of single family houses, um, we had a great workshop with um, Gene Slater about that and Chris uh, Siglin from NCST. Um, and you know, we continue to worry about this and, and work on the legislation. Um, we've heard, um, from some of the industry players that there's a, a pullback in um, these uh, really large hedge funds, for, hedge funds from buying properties right now. And, and that that seems to be related to the um, increased cost of borrowing money. Um, one of the handles that they use to really boost profits is having a mortgage interest deduction or a loan interest reduction. Those uh, for corporations, there's no limit on that, and um, they can write it off as a business expense, and they juice profits with that dramatically. Uh, so the big question is, is, have we seen a pullback in the marketplace um, from these companies? And what I mean by have we seen it, have we seen it in the last couple of weeks? So you're the people on the ground. So if you're seeing, still seeing cash offers that are coming from um, these hedge fund groups, please let us know. Um, if you've seen a pullback, please let us know. You can put it in the chat, but we really kind of want to make sure we're working with um, the most up-to-date information. And finally, um, so we have a provider for our email and it's Rackspace. And um, they were, uh, they had a, what they called a service interruption. It turns out that they were, um, uh, they were, it's a ransomware. They're a very large provider and has always been a stable provider in the past. But um, I ended up as the host and administrator. I lost my email for a week. Um, we've now got a workaround and um, uh, my emails are getting referred to a, another email address and that's, uh, so I'll have access to them again. But uh, I'm saying this because if you sent me an email and um, I didn't respond is a very specific reason, which is I didn't get it. And um, we are going to figure out how to um, uh, restore the service, but that's probably a little bit of ways time away. And I, I, I probably won't see emails that came in from last week. Um, so it's this last Thursday, December 1st through um, uh, this morning. Uh, so if you sent me an email, please just send it again and don't take too much offense. It's just these things happen in our world today. Good, well with that, let me move on to Christy and what's happening out in Congress. Christy. Hi, 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so as far as FY 2023 appropriations updates, currently Congress is operating under a CR until December 16th. Um, it's likely that they may pass a one-week continuing resolution that will last until December 23rd, which would give them an additional week to negotiate uh, final funding levels and the spending bills. Um, the good news is that this morning, Appropriations Chair Leahy released a statement saying that he and uh, Chair DeLuro will introduce an omnibus bill that is fair and bipartisan. So this is uh, good as far as progress. He is hoping that this bill will garner at least 10 Republican Senate votes uh, because this bill increases defense spending to the National Defense Authorization Act level, and it will also increase non-defense programs uh, to stave off the inflation and serve more uh, people. So we will see how that text looks on Monday. Um, so uh, there are also some Republican senators that want to slow down the process, um, specifically Senator uh, Mitch McConnell threatened on Tuesday to extend the CR into next year when Republicans have control of the House. So this would not be ideal because it would lead to a lot of flatline funding for domestic programs and um, overall an increase um, in uh, defense spending is a priority of theirs. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and um, this afternoon, actually, we have a meeting um, with a Senate with a House representative, uh, Jason Smith from Missouri 8. So if you're from Missouri and you're a housing counselor, we'd love for you to join. Um, you're welcome to message me. Um, we're going to be advocating for $70 million towards HUD's housing counseling assistance program until um, the you know the last minute <laughs> so uh, we need all the help we can get uh, to ensure there is enough support for this um, and also Congress uh, before they leave um, they want to work on the tax extenders bill which would renew credits for some programs such as the low income housing tax credit so we're advocating to include the neighborhood homes investment act in any tax extenders bill or potentially even uh, the omnibus bill so uh, we'll see um, how that progresses. And that is all happening. And I'll pass it on to Eric. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Eric, the Outreach Coordinator. Um, as always, I'm here to remind you of our job board. Um, I encourage you all to post your open positions because our job board is specifically for the housing counseling industry. Also, if your organization has any, op any open housing counselor positions, I highly recommend you um, go into our job boards to view resumes from qualified candidates across the country. Over the last couple of months, we've had an increase of traffic to our job board, averaging about 800 visits per month. So that's a lot of individuals visiting our website to see our jobs and uploading jobs and looking for candidates. Um, right now we have about 40 resumes and about 50 positions open, um, posted, I'm sorry. Uh, if you have any questions about this job board, please just contact me and I can walk you, through the walk you through the process of posting. And you can also scan this QR code that's on your screen and it'll take you right to the job board to view and upload and all that good stuff. And let's see. Oh, please tell your team about this uh, job board as well. Your supervisor, your HR recruiting team. And that's all I have. I'm gonna pass it over to Ellie. Thanks, Eric. That's really exciting about the job board, uh, the, you know, the increase in the number of people that are hitting the job board. So we were seeing a, kind of an average of two to 300, and we've gotten up to seven to 800. So people are looking at the job board. So make sure you post your jobs, make sure you look at the resumes that are there. If you have an open position, there might be somebody who's posted a resume that uh, would fill the position that you're looking for. Speaking of open positions, so we know that everybody's been, you know, talking about staffing shortages in all industries uh, around the country and housing counseling is, uh, has not been spared.
from this problem. And so today we are really excited to let you hear about an opportunity that might really help your organization fill some positions uh, for in the housing counseling industry. And so I want to introduce Willie Heineke and Willie is with the Housing Action Illinois program and he is gonna talk to us about this really exciting program, um, the Housing Counselor Core. So Willie, please take it away. Thanks, Ellie. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I am Willie Heineke. There's a great background. I'm waving my hands so you all can see who I am. Um, my pronouns are he, him. I am employed at Housing Action Illinois as the National Service Program Manager. I'm calling in this afternoon from Rockford, Illinois. We're actually uh, stationed out of one of our uh, coalition member organizations right now. We just visited with one of our currently serving AmeriCorps VISTA members in Rockford, and we are uh, conducting this webinar from their offices and their internet doesn't seem to be liking my computer. So I'm on my phone's hotspot. All that to say, if I cut out, I will join back as soon as possible. Please feel free in the chat to let me know if I'm breaking up or anything like that. And I'll do my best to bring that to resolution. Um, so let's jump to the next slide. So here's an agenda and just some housekeeping uh, on my end. Um, <clears throat> we'll start off with a program overview, jump into the Housing Counseling 101, and then I wanna like just dive in so that by the end of this meeting, I want you to have all of the high level information you'll need to uh, make a decision on how many AmeriCorps members you would like to apply to host through my program in 2023, uh, while also getting into the nitty gritty details of how are we going to write a strong application so we get it right on the first time, and we can maximize efficiency so that we can focus all of our time and resources on recruiting. Um, so yeah, like I said, by the end of this, you're going to have all the information you're going to need, and you're going to have all the expertise that's been in my brain that I've been building up over the last eight years of um, national service programming to create strong positions. Um, just a little bit more about me before I jump right in. Uh, I've personally served three terms of AmeriCorps VISTA in my career. I, I served as a summer associate and a member out in Prescott, Arizona at a farmer's market and a transitional housing program, respectively. Uh, I then uh, served as an AmeriCorps VISTA leader at Housing Action Illinois in November 2015, and they offered me a full-time staff position uh, at the conclusion of that term where I uh, took on a lot of responsibilities regarding the management and enhancement of our VISTA program. I was then promoted to this current role of National Service Program Manager in October 2019. And uh, during that quarter four of 2019, I came up with all these excellent plans on how to bolster our VISTA programming. And then March 2020 happened. So then we all held on for dear life and got through the pandemic. And here we are today. Uh, I know some of you were probably on the call last week where I did the brief overview, uh, but we're just going to do that one more time. So if you can jump to the next slide. And the next one. Yeah. So here's a quick um programmatic chart that I want to just go over and the main purpose of this chart right as an intermediary program sometimes organizations like yourself that collaborate with us to host the positions start to think that we're your funder right and and in some senses we do have to mimic the responsibilities of funders and that uh we will have this competitive application process. I'll provide feedback. We'll have to do some compliance work. We'll have to be the ones who tell you when to report and give you the deadlines and when we need to get everything done. We are not your funder. This programmatic chart shows the national headquarters of AmeriCorps located in DC 
you know, works with Congress to figure out what they're going to, how much money they're going to have. And then they tell the Midwest regional office located in Columbus, Ohio, uh, how much money they're going to get, who they can work with and new piloting programs. And then there's us, the Housing Action AmeriCorps Network that you can see in red. We personally view ourselves on the same level in an organizational program and a chart structure as the AmeriCorps members and summer associates that serve with us, the AmeriCorps leaders that serve at Housing Action Illinois' office, the Housing Action Illinois staff like myself, your organizations, and the, the staff members that make them up. Because together, we apply for this funding, right? Those red arrows you see that are coming out of the Housing Action Illinois staff to you all and then going back in are supposed to represent the methods of communication and collaboration that we produce and operate under. And if, frankly, there should be arrows that initiate from each one then go to each one too, because we're all talking to each other in all so many different ways. And, and really, one of the ways that we view ourselves and how we can perform best for you is we want to translate the mumbo jumbo from the federal government into ways that you all can understand it. And then you can tell us what you need. And then I can translate it to the federal government so that you are spending as little of your time dealing with the technical assistance and translation to them and focus on doing the incredible work you're doing in your communities. Next slide. So real quick, what's AmeriCorps VISTA? If you haven't heard of it, it's the Domestic Peace Corps. You know, President JFK, he started the Peace Corps, assassinated LBJ, comes in, and he starts up the Domestic Peace Corps. So they've been around since 65. They predate the AmeriCorps federal agency that the Bush and Clinton administration worked on in the 90s that we know as today as AmeriCorps. Um, so we're not interns. We're not volunteers. We're not assistants. We are AmeriCorps VISTA members, plain and simple. Uh, we here offer one year and summer long full-time positions. You can read those core principles on the slide in front of you. And I think it's obvious why AmeriCorps VISTA aligns with the values that both Housing Action Illinois hold and the values that you all hold. Um, I've skipped the Housing Action Illinois overview because I figure you all have heard enough from us, from my colleagues, David and Wanda, and know what we're about. If not, Happy to do that overview in the Q&A. We want to answer your what if questions. What if we had somebody who could run with this idea for us and figure it out? What if we had the funding levels to do this? What if we weren't so chronically understaffed. What could we get done? And we want to answer that question with you. Next slide. Which I guess actually, and keep on this slide for a moment, which brings me to um, like currently, Housing Action Illinois has been working with this AmeriCorps VISTA program since 2010. Um, we annually offer uh, we annually offer uh, 31 year and 30 summer long positions uh, at about 25 to 35 organizations. And what I'm here to tell you all about today is our housing counseling core. So next slide, please. So here's the, you can see some basic information, but listen to what I have to say. Since we last spoke to this audience in uh, December, 2021. I have piloted a housing counseling core programming both in Illinois and with our partners at Bright Point Development Fund in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Through that pilot, I was able to convince Housing Action's board of directors to dream big with us and change our policy to allow housing counseling agencies nationwide to apply to host with us. I've been in talks with the federal agency and they are willing to approve like literally whatever funding we 
send them in. You know, when I've had my conversations with them, I start spitballing numbers and I say like, what if we triple the size of the program? And they're like, sure, great. What if we quadruple? We've got it. Just let us know. And so the opportunity you all have in front of you is to apply for as many of these member and summer associate positions as you can fund for us. And you'll see all that in a moment with the breakdown of the numbers. On the left-hand side of your screen, you can see what kind of projects AmeriCorps VISTA members should be working on, right? We wanna pilot new ideas, enhance currently existing. We want to amplify the work you're doing, right? You can see just some of the example projects on the left-hand side of your screen. Now, part of the reason why I decided to try to roll this out was because my colleagues, David Young and, and our colleagues in the department, in the capacity build department, I just heard them talking about it for like almost years that like, you know, finding people to pass this exam and that want to do the work and can stick around has been a challenge. And so um, it's my personal belief that part of that has to do with, you know, Scantron testing just not being a form of good testing. Uh, that HUD decides. And that's why we think having them participate in the study groups that Housing Action, that Wanda Collins at Housing Action Illinois runs while they're in their year of service to then pass the exam, keep serving with you, keep shadowing, get an understanding of what, not just what the test means, but like, what does it mean in the community? How do I actually execute this work, right? Seeing is believing. The best way to learn is by doing for people. And so we are of the mind that if we train them up, have them pass this exam, then you're going to have a one-year experience at your organization, HUD-certified potential housing counselor that you can employ after your year of service, after their year of service. Um, okay, so that's that slide. Moving on. <laughs> We've got key dates and timeline. Here it is, y'all. The applications are ready to be sent out. I'm happy to send you, um, I'm happy to send you the, uh, the application, like the, some of the application, the application will be ready next week. Happy to send you some of it right after this webinar. Here's the timeline. Applications will be due on January 27th. We will spend the month of February reviewing the applications. Our application process, right? We don't, like, you don't send us something and then we say yes or no. I spend the month reviewing it, polishing it for you and sending it back giving some feedback, and then you send it back to me. We get it approved. If I approve your position, I have a 100% approval rating from the federal government on positions I approve over the last three years. So if I approve it, it'll get approved. And then we'll spend March through, um, we'll put this, we'll, we'll recruit March through July. You know, positions can start as early as June. Uh, especially the summer associate positions, right? Those have to start in June, but the uh, vast majority of our VISTA positions start in August. Um, next slide. Finances, pretty simple. For it's $5,000 per member and it's $1,000 per summer associate. There is a supplemental benefit and that is not required, but it is so strongly recommended. Um, and I'll get into a little bit of why it really has to entail with recruitment purposes. Um, and I think this is a pretty great deal. $5,000 for a one year full-time AmeriCorps member right? That's, that's less than the benefits of one of your staff positions. Um, same thing for the summer. 
with the we spend this money, the federal government, we have a cost share set up so that like we have to pay the living allowance or the, the, the salary they earn uh, for a portion of the cohort. And so we spend the vast majority of these funds on that. And then we also spend it on other administrative costs, getting some software, um, giving us the money we need to recruit and market the position so that you have a strong candidate pool for these positions themselves. Um, the short version of the why we need the supplemental benefits is it's going to increase your recruitment. Uh, but I'll get into that more in a moment. Next slide. And so we, we're getting into the application overview. And so I, I did see um, there, there was one question that came into play. So I guess, could we could just go back and take a brief Q&A about the program overview, any specific questions? about the funding or anything I've just gone over, making sure you all are still with me. Um, I see we had one question from Emily Blank. So Willie, we'll do all the questions at the end. It's okay, just, just forge ahead. Thanks Emily, or thanks Ellie. Cool. <laughs> so forging ahead, application section breakdown. Um, what we've done this year is we've broken out our AmeriCorps application so that it is a two-parter, even though it says three sections. The first two sections are the first part, and that's on a survey monkey. It is real basic level information. We just need to make sure you're an eligible organization in the federal government's eyes. And we wanna see what your recruitment strategy is. We wanna see like who, how much of your staff resources are you willing to commit to work with us? Because we need somebody who's going to be recruiting with us and we need somebody who's going to be supervising with us. So that's really like the organizational assessment. Section two, which is also on the same survey monkey, is just the broad strokes of your position, right? In your own words, how would you explain what you want your position to do, how you want them to do it, and what the quantitative impact is going to be? Uh, this is put into a survey monkey format so that it is user friendly on your end and maximizes the efficiency and accuracy of our review process and overall grant writing process to the federal government. Now, section three is the nitty gritty. It's a word document. Um, section three is where I copy paste what you say to me and tell the federal government that. And that's where most of the feedback that I have to do plays into um, this section. I'm gonna dive more into the, each one right now. Next slide, please. So application section one, those are the high level points that we're trying to figure out, right? Um, we're gonna collaborate with you when it comes to recruitment, when it comes to onboarding when it comes to supervising and reporting your position. But, you know, frankly, we just, we can't do it alone. Um, and it's not like we're asking for somebody to like dedicate their full amount of time or hours into this. It's more like, are you willing to spend one hour a week, less than one hour, hour of a week screening and, inter and scheduling interviews during March through July when we need to be doing that, doing those interviews, um, having somebody that's gonna supervise the position, really, it's not, we're not asking a whole lot, I don't think. Um, so really basic level information, you all should be able to breeze through this. And the supplemental benefits, again, this is a time to get creative. Um, I can talk about what kinds of supplemental benefits, because it's the federal agency, um, it's more confusing than it needs to be. <laughs> they basically say you can provide us a monthly supplemental benefit as long as it's not a check written to them. It can be a check to their landlord for their rent. It can be a reimbursement for their utility bills. It can be a gift card to the local gas station so that they can uh, use that for transportation purposes. 
It's a gift card to the local grocery store. It's those types of things, right? One of the other types of benefits we've seen people do, like particularly our Habitat for Humanity chapters, but even some of our non-metropolitan, non-major metropolitan areas, right? Like here in Rockford, for example, uh, which we would call a micropolitan area of Illinois. Uh, they have board members, uh, executive directors will go out and find community members that are empty nesters, maybe have a coach house and are willing to offer that at low to no cost to the AmeriCorps member for the purposes of them serving for one year. So really getting creative with that uh, can be one of the best ways to make your position stand out amongst the national arena of AmeriCorps VISTA positions uh, and make yours one that is more attractive. Next slide. Section two is um, broad strokes of your idea. Um, what are your positions gonna focus on? What are the quantitative goals? And, and what, how is the project going to be sustained? We have um, check boxes on how the projects can be sustained with the most common answers. The quantitative goals are just, and I don't think you all will have this much of a trouble because of the amount of guidance we provide in the instructions and resources packet. But um, at the end of the day, they're building the capacity. They're not the ones providing the housing counseling services, but as a result of the capacity built, you all, they've been able to help X amount of new people. Every position should either have people receiving services or housing units developed, made available, so on and so forth. Next slide. Uh, section three, this is the Word document. This is what I can send you all right now if you want it. Um, the Survey Monkey will be ready really soon. Uh, the nitty gritty details, application section three, need statement. Using citable evidence, tell the federal government why your community needs the support of an AmeriCorps VISTA member. And then two, how is what is the evidence that your AmeriCorps VISTA positions, projects, and overall theory of change are likely to be effective? That's all we're doing with that. VISTA assignment description is a document that kind of acts as our holy text for the VISTA member. It's their work plan. It has a goal that explains who your organization is, what your community is, what this VISTA position is going to do, objectives, what projects are they going to work on throughout the year, and what kind of outcomes are those going to produce, member activities, and actually that's I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry. And then uh, three is opportunity listing. And that's the uh, job posting that we have to put on the AmeriCorps portal um, to post the position. Next slide. Yeah, I did get ahead of myself, sorry. Uh, the need statement, the main thing you need to know about this is don't reinvent the wheel. Use the language you have in your funding from HUD for your housing counseling intermediary stuff to substantiate the need statement, right? It's okay, rinse and repeat, customize it a little bit and we'll be good to go. Next slide. The VISTA assignment description, right? It has three sections. Goal of the project is just the big picture, long-term goals, what's gonna happen. Objectives are the key projects, objectives, outcomes, member activities of those objectives, what's the workflow, what's the day-to-day -day look like, right? This is, the VAD is where we have to provide a lot of feedback and that's where we specialize. You know, I don't let perfect get in the way of good for you all on this. Let me perfect it for you. Get me a good draft and I'll make it perfect and we'll get it approved by the federal government on our first try. Next slide. Opportunity listings, right? This is really our main recruitment tool. Um, 
what USA jobs is to federal employment is what the AmeriCorps portal and opportunity listings are to AmeriCorps positions. They're comprised of a few sections. One is a two-liner. So the job listing has the title and it lists out all the positions and it has like a two-line description. Think clickbait, right? Think like, how do you, how can you put together a zippy one-liner, two-liner that says what, like who you're looking for and what they're going to get done, right? Um, we've used like four walls and a roof don't make a home. Come recruit a thousand volunteers to make, help us make that true. Stuff like that, right? That's for a different type of program, but um, I hope you get the idea. And then you have your program description and member duties. And this is where you get to sell yourself. This organizational description, what are your position responsibilities and who are you looking for, right? We have examples that you can use to jump from, um, but those are the three main things we want you to hit in there. Next slide. All right, best practices. And then we're gonna do the q and I promise. All right, I've been saying it a lot of times because it needs to be said a lot of times, the supplemental benefits. In 2021, my program recruited at a 75% rate. And that was overall. And so that was 75% for positions at zero to $300 a month. We recruited a 100% rate for positions offering $300 or more. And I didn't put the stat in there because it just happened in this year. The positions that offered $500 or more a month recruited at 150%. That's right. I said 150. They found more qualified, competent candidates than they had positions for. And then they made a new one to keep the extra one on. It's a wild idea. Pay them more and you're going to recruit more. Um, thorough recruitment y'all get specific with your marketing ideas we're gonna we're gonna market and we're gonna increase the candidate pool on a broad scale but you need to spread the word in your own communities if you want a local person you're gonna have to find them we're here in illinois i don't know and i don't have connections everywhere in the nation, but we do have some best practices where we're going to generate you a solid pool. But if you want a local person, you might have to help find them. And making a comprehensive and compelling opportunity listing is how you're going to help us get you that broader pool for you. All right. Uh, that quantified objectives and activities. I never want to hear the phrase, uh, the work is, is this person's irreplaceable or uh, it's unquantifiable how much they helped out. It needs to be quantifiable. We need to tell the federal government how good we are so that they keep on funding us and give us even more money. And that way, the AmeriCorps members can show off how good they've done and how much they've learned. That starts with you creating strong objectives and member activities that have quantified, measurable outcomes in them. <clears throat> Last, certainly not least, if you apply for an AmeriCorps VISTA member position, you should apply for an AmeriCorps VISTA summer associate position. Have the summer associate get the ball rolling on the VISTA members' positions, responsibilities, so that there's an even better baton handoff between the summer associate and the VISTA members so the VISTA member can hit the ground running. But also, it, it's kind of hard to find people who want to sign up for a full year and make below the federal minimum wage on a biweekly basis to do this level of work. It's a lot easier to convince somebody that served with us over the summer to stick around for a year because you're going to develop a relationship with them and you're going to make it, you're going to show them how meaningful this work can be. And they're going to, they're, they're not going to be able to help themselves, but sign up for the year long position. Next slide. Keep it going. Common challenges. <clears throat> We are AmeriCorps VISTA members. We are not your interns. We are not your assistants. We are not the people that do things so that you can do bigger and better things. We're the ones doing the bigger, better things with you because we want to help out. As such, do not ever say you're, they're going to assist with. They're going to do stuff on an as-needed basis. Nuh-uh. They're going to collaborate with staff to do things. They're going to do things in coordination with staffs. They're going to do things on an ongoing basis to identify and seize opportunities that we can't say we know right now, but we know are going to happen. 
I just, I swear, if I see the word intern, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to not approve you, but I am going to ding you a point or two on the application. We are AmeriCorps members and summer associates. If you want interns, go to your local college and get some interns. If you want AmeriCorps members, come to Housing Action Illinois. Data is important. You all may want positions that enhance your data tracking system so that you can better inform your grant writing processes, your reporting outcomes, so on and so forth. That's great. Your VISTA, your AmeriCorps member cannot just be your data entry person. It, you have to, they can't just manage your database. They have to be enhancing it. They have to, and, and you have to explain that a part of the responsibility of enhancing it is managing it so that they can better understand what improvements need to be made into the system. And how does enhancing this database fight poverty explain that? in the objectives, in the member activities of that VISTA assignment description. Next slide. <laughs> Organizations in the past have said the phrase, it feels like you're asking me the same question over, over, and over again, Willie. And we kind of are. The overhaul my colleague Brandon Grigsby and I just completed on this application to create the SurveyMonkey and Word document setup should bring a lot of that to keel. But we still are like, you know, because let's, for an example, section one and section three, like we're asking you what resources do you have for recruitment? How are you going to offer supplemental benefits? Who's the staff member that's going to work with us? What ideas do you have about spreading the word? And then we ask about recruitment again in section three, because we need to attract candidates from that national arena to make your position stand out the most. So we're asking about recruitment twice. Another example is the, you know, section two is broad strokes of the position. And then section three is the nitty gritty, but that's all they are. And we're asking, it, it may feel like we're asking the same question twice, but we're, we're trying to have you say it in your own words so that we can understand it and then you can better inform and complete the version that we have to send to the federal government in section three with cited sources and we need to we need to sell americorps on your position and they like what i'm selling and i promise you we can sell them this last example of is is more of the same uh, right like the vista assignment description is supposed to be the kind of synthesized, crystallized document of the entire application into one thing. It's our elevator pitch on what is the year gonna look like? What's gonna get done? How are they gonna do it? Why do they need to do it? All in one document, all in one place. And that thing, I, it's, we, we put a lot of work into it now because it is so useful. It's useful in the interviews, in the onboarding, in the recruitment, in the reporting, in the performance reviews, in the performance improvement plans, if we have to put something like that together, that document doing all this work now is just gonna pay off throughout the rest of the time. And I believe that was my last slide. So if you wanna to move to the next one, um, there's how you can request an application from me. Um, like I said, section three is ready to go. Um, I. I'll be announcing it to the rest of my uh, coalition members next week. You all, if you would like, can have a sneak peek at it and start working on it right now. The survey monkey is just about ready to go. I just need to fine tune a couple more things to make sure it's as perfect as possible for you all. I know I don't try to let perfect get in the way of good, but this is a time when I really want to make sure the survey monkey is dialed in so that it's collecting all the right information so that you can save progress, so on and so forth. The survey monkey should only take about 25 minutes though. So giving you the section three, the Word document stuff, if you all really wanna start working on that right away, you can have it. And that is that. So it's time for Q and A. I have some polls just asking some basic questions. Um, so I kinda, Ellie, what do you think? Should we do Q and A or should we do the polls first? Um, let's do the Q and A. There's a lot of really good questions. 
So All let's right. get to that. So the first, the first thing isn't really a question. It is a, a statement that somebody made that I want to read out before we get into the questions. So this is um, somebody in Michigan who says, uh, we have an AmeriCorps service member through the, a state program in Michigan, and it's been a great experience so far. We commit to paying half of their stipend for the year and providing our side of the trainings. It's a lot of work, but we might have capacity for a different non-AmeriCorps position once their service year is done. That's a great deal. I actually got into housing counseling after my AmeriCorps service term. So just wanted to read that kind of uh, support for this program. So the very first question is, um, I know VISTAs cannot do direct service. So what's a typical week look like for a VISTA? Is there a reason this program isn't part of the state national AmeriCorps funding? I think it is part of that. And maybe that was just in, um, cause this is a very first question. So go ahead, Willie, and answer. Yeah, AmeriCorps VISTA and state and national are different, right? And like there is, like AmeriCorps VISTA works on the capacity building, right? So like a typical week is they have a check-in meeting with you on Monday afternoon after they've cleared the inbox and set their weekly agenda for what they need to get done. You meet with them, confirm it all, add anything else that they need to start working on. And it's like, hey, I've got a PowerPoint where I'm doing first-time homebuyer education to a class of 80 people. I really want to update my uh, PowerPoint. They update the PowerPoint. They, you really want them to uh, maximize the efficiency by which you're able to follow up with those people. So then they generate a whole new uh, registration and follow-up system so that with like three clicks, you can send out all the follow-up email you want, right? So they're working on that stuff. They send it to you, make sure it looks right to you. And then you do it. They're trying to equip you with better tools. They're doing research. They're participating in a housing counselor uh, training from Housing Action Illinois. And so it's that kind of stuff that they're working on on a week to week basis. It's a, it's a, they're not delivering it. They can, they can shadow you though on the, on the trip. If you need somebody to help run the event with you you could they could help with that um and then they can really learn and get to see what it's like to deliver the information as well does that answer your question i don't know if that sounds like a week's worth of work to you but if you want it done as well as they can do it it, it probably is a week's worth of work i think that's a, i think those are uh, that's a good example um okay so there's two questions here kind of the along the same lines just kind of wondering about what if i don't have a position available at the end of the year am i required to no. give them a job no no you're not required a third of the americorps alumni from our program are offered positions at their organization um but yeah hey i i all if, if you have a crystal ball i would love to use it mine's currently out of order things happen things change you're not, you don't, you don't have to offer them a job. Hey, Ellie, do you know, is there like a job board where there's a centralized place where everybody could look to see the hundreds of housing counseling positions available nationwide? There sure is. And if you want to post your job there, the link is in the chat. <laughs> housing Action Illinois is also extremely dedicated to setting them up for success after their term of service. Uh, we call it life after service placement rate. Uh, right, job and education program, another term of service, our program, the day after their term of service is higher than the national averages is six months after their term of service. We do a, a radically robust training to get them on resumes, cover letters, interviews, panels, everything and everything they're going to need to succeed in that transitionary period. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Okay. Um, do we get to interview and select the person or is that person chosen for us? Heck, of course, I'm not going to enter. I'm not going to tell you who you have to work for. What we're going to do though, is we're going to screen everybody and we're going to conduct a first round interview so that like everybody's on the same page about like what they're going to get paid. We, and we're going to assess things like what's their motivation? Have they really thought this through? Like, how are you going to survive for a year or a summer making below the federal minimum wage on a bi-weekly basis? And why the heck do you want to do it? 
right? We're going to make sure that from an AmeriCorps and a Housing Action Illinois perspective, they're in line with policies and they have a high or moderate likelihood of finishing their term of service. Then we hand it off to you to do one final round interview where you determine, do they have the skill set? Do they have the personality and communication style that aligns with my organizations and my style of supervision? Do I think they have what it takes to finish out here? And if so, then you get to offer the position over the phone or <clears throat> however you like to do so. But then Housing Action handles the formal written offer and all onboarding processes from there on. You, if somebody submits a resume and cover letter to you and you want to like do a first round interview with, them, interview with them and reverse it, and then we make sure it's all good, that works. But nine times out of 10, we're going to do that for you. Um, on a weekly basis, you'll get an email from us that says, hey, your dashboard is up to date. Take a look. Reach out to them within 24 hours if you'd like an interview. Okay. Hi, all Emily. Right, so David Young. Can I jump in for just a second? Sure, sure. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's David Young with Housing Action Illinois. Thank you, Willie, for uh, the presentation. Uh, and I know that there are a couple of other questions. I have to jump off in just a minute for another meeting. But I just wanted to throw in my two cents uh, regarding the Housing Counselor Corps. Uh, I want to make sure that everyone understands that the idea behind the Housing Counselor Corps is to not only increase the capacity of your housing counseling organizations to allow you to do more things, but to train that AmeriCorps member during the year, during their term of service, so that uh, they've taken the exam, uh, they've passed the exam, and then uh, after the term of service, if you have a housing counseling position available, that you'd be able to hire them. And because they have gotten that experience working in your organization and understanding your processes and procedures, they have a, um, a leg up in um, transitioning to become a full-time housing counselor. The other thing that's really important about the Housing Counselor Corps is that for housing counseling organizations, if you hire someone uh, who uh, you want to train to be a housing counselor, um, that usually requires a, a, a pretty significant salary. And what happens if that individual that you've invested time in uh, to become a certified housing counselor doesn't pass the exam? Using the housing counselor core, uh, you have the opportunity of having someone help to build your capacity uh, uh, and get them the, the training that they need at a far less cost than if you were to do a um, uh, do the traditional way that that you would do this, that you would hire someone and then hope that they can pass the exam. So um, the housing counselor core was really designed to help organizations to build their capacity and be able to uh, train and certify um, prospective counselors at a much less significant cost than it would be doing it the traditional way. So um, ask Willie questions. Um, he will provide his, his email address so that if you have additional questions post uh, this webinar, you can ask him. And if you have ideas on things that we can do um, uh, to tweak the program for you, let us know. But we hope that now that we're able to expand this nationally, that you will take advantage of this opportunity. We're really excited to be able to offer it and to hopefully increase increase the pipeline of prospective counselors uh, that will be uh, entering our um, industry. So thanks. David, I appreciate David, the opportunity to throw David, my be, two cents. David, before we lose you, um, yes. uh, Willie or David, um, are you going to talk about the public housing resident opportunity? Yep. I'm glad you mentioned that, uh, Bruce. So um, the um, um, a wonderful thing about um, uh, the um, AmeriCorps service program is that the for individuals that live in public housing, um, their stipend uh, that they would receive as an AmeriCorps member is not counted against their household income. So it doesn't impact their, um, uh, their um, uh, public housing residency in a negative way. So 
Um, it is a good opportunity for housing counseling organizations uh, to work with housing authorities in um, their communities to recruit uh, residents of housing authorities to consider a housing counseling career. One, uh, as I said, it does not impact their household income, so it will not impact or negatively impact their housing status. Secondly, it provides that individual with a career opportunity that might not otherwise be available to them. And I think that we have found from working with um, some residents of uh, public housing authorities that they're very enthusiastic, that they're very eager uh, for these opportunities and go on to really incredible careers in our field. So uh, Willie can provide you with more information about that. But as you are looking to recruit individuals for these positions, consider reaching out to your local housing authorities and making them aware so that they can make their residents aware uh, of these uh, available positions. So Bruce, thank you for, uh, for reminding us to mention that. And again, thanks for the opportunity to present this webinar and I'll turn it back to Ellie and Willie to answer the rest of the questions. Well, because thanks, I do wanna say before one, question too, David. I, I didn't include it in the PowerPoint because um, we didn't hear back from HUD in writing about it since I asked. But there's from last summer, we got told from HUD that it would be okay to use comprehensive housing counseling grant dollars to pay for this project participation fee. And that is correct. Um, we are, um, uh, you can use your comprehensive housing counseling funds to cover um, the cost of bringing on a VISTA. So if you uh, have those dollars available uh, within your comprehensive uh, uh, housing counseling uh, subgrant, then you do have the uh, ability to use those funds to cover the um, uh, the the host fee uh, for the housing counselor core. Well, that's good news. <laughs> okay, on to the next questions. Uh, thank you so much, David. So uh, I think you did a little bit of this, Willie, but I'm going to ask these two questions anyway, and you can and you can repeat what you may have already said. But um, please elaborate on the supplemental fee of three to five hundred dollars and on the difference between member and summer associate. Great. Fantastic questions, y'all. Member, year long, indirect service. Summer associate is eight to 10 weeks over the summer, June to August direct service and indirect service. So those summer associates, do you have any like community events that you could use like just bodies to like go to, to spread the word? Get two of these AmeriCorps summer associates and send them to every community event that you want. And, you know, train them up on the elevator pitch, give them the digital and print materials they need and have them nine to five attending those events all summer long, spreading the word to attract more people build new partnerships, get the ball rolling. Um, they can, uh, yeah, the, the instructions and resources packet that's also ready to go has a, like, I think it has four VISTA assignment descriptions for you to look over to see what those can look like. Um, yeah, so like, and, and they can still do indirect service because we feel like indirect, over in our experience, a summer associate can, can complete about one to two like research projects and then develop a plan to execute them that can be handed off. Um, or they can do one direct search project and one indirect, but you know, it takes two weeks to get them on board and really knowing what they're talking about. And then you want two weeks on the end to like wrap everything up and make sure no stone goes unturned and the baton is handed off successfully. So then you're really looking at six to eight weeks of project execution time. Um, Okay. Um, For, that answers the member versus summer associate, the supplemental benefit. So like you pay us and then we pay some of the AmeriCorps living allowance, right? And then you would also reserve three to $500 per month in your own budget that you would on a monthly basis 
in the form of a check directly to their landlord, reimbursing them for their utilities, um, a, a, a gas card, a grocery store card, um, really anything that isn't a check written to them. And I mean, gosh almighty, do I know how much it would be so nice if we could just send them a check, but the federal government makes it more complicated. So you can also, the other side of it is like, you could, if you can try to like find low to no cost how with um, a community member who has a, like a, a, a coach house or maybe a spare bedroom. Like we've, we've had people that are like empty nesters that like want to bring somebody in and like serving their community brings joy to their heart and they willing to do it. So does that answer the question? I think so. I'm going to, I just want to let you know, Willie, you're, you're starting to cut a little bit. So you might want to just turn your video off so that you can continue to answer questions. We don't want to lose you. <laughs> yeah, Ellie, and I also just want to like, if, if people are dropping off, I'd love to get those polls out just so I can get a, a number. But if it looks like people are staying on, then I'm happy to keep answering questions. as well. Okay, sure. Let's get the poll out quick. Let's get a couple. Of, well, there's, there's three, three different, different ones. ones. So let's do the first one. And I'm just now realizing I should have said there should be a maybe option on there, but that's <laughs> over. Yeah, if you, if you want to say maybe, if you just want to throw that in the chat, um, I said yes and no because last year, like a lot of organizations just said yes, like send me the. Yeah, it looks like we have we have a uh, several maybes. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next next uh, question. This is always the hard part for me. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, and I'm just gonna show the results first, so everybody can see. So it's kind of a half and half there, Willie. That's great. All right, here's the second one. Yeah, so that again is this is just me trying to get a good read on how many people um, may be interested in applying or want to do it. So if you said yes to the last one, if you know you would like to do one member, two members, three members, or more. Looks like it's heavy on the member, on the one. That's right, that's great, that's great. All right, I'm gonna end and share. Just so you can see, a couple of people. Yeah. With three. Oh. All right, last one. And again, this is just for me to, if you want to have a follow-up one-on-one call, happy to do that. I um, will be <laughs> sending out follow-up emails later today and tomorrow that will have a nice scheduling app that you can schedule your interviews with. Uh, I will let everybody know, we'll also include um, all of the information that Willie put into the PowerPoint, we will include that in the email that goes out with the recording of this webinar. So you'll have his contact information as well as that Vista email. Great. I, I see somebody said they really need the one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> if, if I feel like if everybody who's a maybe wants a one-on-one, -on -one, um, please, 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 please. I um, I really, I did, I did my best to try to give you every, all the information you would need, but I know like, hey, sometimes you, you have much more specific questions that you want to get all the nitty gritty details into. Oh, but great, that NA not applying number is really helpful too. Okay, um, it, so here's the next question. Sounds like the supplemental benefit is not a requirement, simply an option to make your organization more attractive to acquiring a person for the program. Is that correct? 
Yes, that is accurate. Okay. Is there a position description we can look at as an example? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I uh, Part of when you request an application, I, are, you, are you talking about like look at right this moment or... No, no, I think that I don't think that that's the question. I think it's just in general. Is there something to help them kind of oh, develop the description? Something like an instructions and resources packet? Yes, there is. I uh, everything I just said <laughs> is uh, written down in a nice packet um, that looks nice, and it has, I think, at least three Vista assignment descriptions for your perusing. If you like set up the one-on-one -on -one call or, or shoot me an email that says like, hey, I want a position that would broadly focus on this, this, and this, I can go into our archives and find the positions that we already have on file that are like that and send you those. Because um, we've been recruiting for about, I think we have like 12 positions that are either recruited or are actively recruiting right now. And they focus on a lot of different things. So like, you know, it's my program, I get to share those and I'll share those with you. So there will totally be things that you can, templates that you can copy and paste from, put your name of organization and quantitative goals for your program versus theirs. Okay, what level of position is required to bring someone into a housing counseling program? I'm not sure, sure I, I can you say that in other words or what level of position? Yeah, I'm not quite sure. So um, this is from Patricia Wilkins. Patricia, can you um, maybe in the chat or in the Q&A box, expound a little bit on your question and, and we'll get to it. Okay, next question. Um, how much success do you have with placement as in how many applicants apply and are successful with placement? Oh, like a, a re retention rate. We we operate at the national average of eighty percent, um, and so that's eighty percent of the people that start a position finish their position. Uh, right now, our cohort is currently rocking a one hundred percent retention rate at this very moment. Um, we uh, and some of those what like that twenty percent of people that leave that includes people that like got offered a job at the organization because things were moving so quickly. They just needed to have them become a staff member, right? So like part of that 80%, part of that 20% is like, oh, things just like worked so well that they didn't finish their year because they did such a good job and they're ready to go now. Um, okay, so th this question has been answered, but I think some people may have signed in a little bit, uh, a little bit later and so didn't quite catch this information, but is this limited to your state? To you, your state, Willie? <laughs> no, no, it's not. No, anyone in the U.S. can apply. I have um, approval from the federal government to do so. And um, again, to like the limit, like please, the limit doesn't exist on how many positions I can apply for. Tell me what you need and we'll approve it and we'll fund it. America, the federal agency, we're a exemplary program in their eyes and we know this program is going to work based on my near decade of experience um, doing this work I know this is going to take off and uh, this is the year to dream big with us and and and, and come in um, and pilot nationally uh, we have the tools um, we're upgrading our reporting and management system so that you you can get a text from us that says, "Hey, you need to do this," and it'll just happen like that. Right? We we're really upgrading our systems. We're ready to scale. Um, we're gonna we're gonna be collaborative partners. We're gonna have a response time, an email response time of no more than forty eight hours, if not like same day. We're we're gonna become extremely accessible and extremely organized in a way that we can handle the hopefully large influx of organizations that apply through this program. Okay. Um, so uh, this person asked this question that David actually, David Young actually talked about this already, but um, again, this might be somebody who signed in late. I got a message from a couple of people that they signed in really late, but uh, do you know if the supplemental benefits can be covered with the comp comprehensive counseling grant? And the answer to that is it sounds like it can be in conversations yeah. that 
David and Willie have had with HUD. Yeah, and we're still being, I mean, I don't know about y'all, but does HUD respond very, very quickly to all of your questions and answers? Because sometimes, and rightfully so, right? Like that was, we, we know you can use it for your project participation fee, but like it's, it's been a while since we talked with them. We just want to make sure we want to fine tune all those details. Soft, yes, right? Um, and we'll, we're getting something in writing from them soon. Um, okay. Oh, here's the clarification from Patricia Wilkins. What level of education does your agency require when placing them with an agency? High school education and GED is our minimum requirement. We fundamentally believe that lived experience and our education system isn't um, right for everybody and that people... You don't need to go to college. You don't have to have a bachelor's degree to do this work. I think it helps. Um, and I defer to you all on if you have, like if you have a higher education requirement, that's your decision. Um, we know, and we have worked with people that have high school and GEDs and they've done such impressive work um, that we even shock the federal agency and the organization's staff members. Um, so. That's that. Great. What is the difference between direct and indirect service? So, right. Uh, think about it. My best example of what direct versus indirect service is, it's not, I, I don't have a housing counseling example right now. The one I always go with is think about a, a soup kitchen. The people that are cooking the meals, serving the meals and cleaning up afterwards and doing intake with those folks that are participating are doing direct service. Indirect service is the person who designed and trained the re volunteer recruit, the volunteer recruited the volunteers, trained them on how to do everything, and they're doing it. They're the ones writing the grant to keep the doors open, and they're the ones that are building the partnership with the local food, uh, grocery store to have low to no cost food to cook, right? Indirect service is the capacity building, setting the stage behind the scenes, folks. Direct service is the people that are on the stage delivering the lines, delivering the services. I hope that helps. Okay. Uh, if a candidate is not local, who would cover the relocation cost? Uh, there is a policy. So like, generally speaking, like there's not like a, I, they're not going to send me a, a ticket for their move and say, you have to pay for this. Um, what is in place are two benefits known as a settling in allowance and a relocation allowance to the federal government. If a candidate moves, uh, relocates from more than 50 miles uh, from their home address to wherever they're going to be to serve, they are eligible for $750 in their first paycheck living allowance deposit. And then the federal government will give them like a 40 cents per mile check too, but they process that. It happens on their time. Sometimes it's delivered the first week of service and sometimes it's delivered during the eighth week. So, uh, yep, that's relocation cost coverage that we provide. Okay. This and, is not this. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to, I was going to say too, like, you know, the, the remote work policy is whatever your remote work policy is. If you, if you do hybrid, they can do hybrid. If you do full remote, they can do full remote. Personally speaking, I don't believe fully remote onboarding works for AmeriCorps VISTA members in my own experience with the AmeriCorps leaders that I directly supervise. I have instituted a, uh, during the first 60, 60 to 90 days, AmeriCorps members or leaders with me at my organization and I directly supervise have to come into the office three days a week. So, if, and if you require everyone to be fully in person, then they're required to be fully in person. That's that. Okay. Um, so this is not specifically for you, uh, Willie, but it's, a, it's an important question in, in general. I thought uh, a bachelor's of science or a bachelor of arts was needed by HUD for housing counseling. And the answer to that is no. You as an organization may require that, but HUD does not require that. HUD requires passing the certification exam and getting at least six months of training before doing one-on-one -on -one counseling. Uh, if anybody wants to add anything more to that, feel free, Willie. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. 
I think I said it well the first time. Okay. So that was, oh, no, oh my gosh, people are popping questions in. In the past, we've struggled with finding applicants to simply apply. Not sure why. On average, how many applicants do you see apply to a position? I'm going to assume that they're asking for through the AmeriCorps program. Yeah, so it's a fantastic question. I'd love to hear it. Um, I have So last year, we took our biggest hit. We were at three applications per position. Um, and, you know, you said you struggled with why, and I just want to, like, address that. Um, because if you didn't offer a supplemental benefit, you're trying to hire somebody to work for you for a full year at below the federal minimum wage on a biweekly basis doing the level of work that you're expecting them to do, which is if it was written as a normal job description, you would say bachelor's required, master's preferred. It's really hard to find somebody who wants to do that. Um, the other side of it is that nobody knows what AmeriCorps is. Uh, the last brand awareness poll that was put out showed that 17% of the American population can correctly identify and explain the purpose of AmeriCorps VISTA. Um, we are tackling that actively. I expect us to be at five to seven applicants per position. And you know, an interesting statistic that I don't have off the top of my head, but I am going to look up because it's so important is because I told you in 2021, our program overall recruited at 75%, but it recruited at 100% for the positions that were offering $300 or more in supplemental benefits. So I think that kind of speaks for itself. And again, this year, for the positions that offered $500 or more in supplemental benefits, they recruited at 150%. They had too many qualified, competent, eager individuals and they had positions to fill. So then we made a new position so they could keep that other person too. Well, that's great. Um, I do want to say to the person who asked that question, if you're talking about applicants to apply to your organization for the for a housing counseling position, I encourage you to go to our job board. There are 40 resumes there of people who are interested in potentially working for a housing counseling organization. And then the last question that I'm going to read to you is, are background checks done? Yeah, by the federal agency. And the you can't. Uh, no, you can't be on the sex offenders list and you haven't, you can't have murdered somebody recently is their rule. I, I know, and I know I'm speaking kind of plainly. I don't have that statistic and that policy um, uh, memorized, but those are the, the, the uh, records and background checks that are conducted. Um, yeah. All right. Well, that was the last question. Thank you so much, Willie, for, for your time today. And I know that your uh, email inbox is going to get really full. Yeah, I hope so. I, I, I see some people have already reached out. So I'm really excited to see that. Um, okay. Um, and, and yeah, so great. Thanks, everybody, so much. I I hope that was helpful and I provided the information you need to make a decision. Thanks. And I'm going to hand it over to Bruce to wrap it up. Excellent. Thank you, Willie. Um, pretty exciting program. And um, we're uh, very interested in seeing how, how, how quickly we can move this around. Okay. So um, quick reminder to join NHRC or renew your membership dues. Really trying to get as many people in for this year still as possible. Um, Emma, uh, uh, Ebony's done a lot of work to uh, um, make it a little bit easier. So um, you can now do it on credit card and there's the link right there. And you just need to go. It's because we're part of Tide Center. It's a foundation for uh, uh, progressive nonprofits. The um, uh, Tide Center, uh, you, you have to choose which project we are. We're the National Housing Resource Center, as you know. So you have to scroll down and find us, click it. And uh, you can do that. And we have the application online. So um, you can go to our website and get it. So all that stuff is very easy. We do have the discount on the CoreLogic CredCo credit reports. 
Um, we had the discount on the Savvy Online Student Loan Service, which turned out to be quite useful for people. Um, we do put out notices periodically of interesting and unusual funding opportunities, and some ex sometimes some other things like a media opportunity that might um, uh, where we're looking for an opportunity to get onto some major media outlet. We really push those out to the membership. But the real thing to do this is because you support our work and allow us to keep going, uh, doing what we're doing, um, and especially the non-fundable parts of it that uh, I think we all benefit from. I mean, we did win um, $100 million in the uh, uh, federal budget for the, um, um, the Housing Stabilization Counseling Program. Um, we have been really pushing hard on um, the HUD Housing Counseling Funding. Uh, we're also working on other kinds of opportunities like that. But so we're um, it's all voluntary membership. So hope you all step up and join us. Thanks so much. And I think that's it for today. Thanks, everybody.